proud. Son, I've got kids older than you. Okay. okay. For everybody, I'd like to call back to order the Pasco County Board of County Commission meeting of October 20th, 2020, and remind everybody to please silence your electronic devices and mute your microphones unless you're speaking. We're going to go ahead and proceed with a public hearing agenda, starting with item P1. Madam Clerk, we have a proof of item P1. Yes, item P71. Yes, it is planned to see one today, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Huh. Yes. It was published in the Tampa Bay Times on September 27th, 2020. Thank you. Okay. Whose show is this? I'll read it off until they get up here, that I guess. Would be ordinance by the Pasco County Board of County Commission is impending Chapter 106 of the Pasco County Court of Ordinance to add a provision requiring a person removing any direct or damaged vehicle from a roadway to remove and lawfully dispose of any glass or other in injurious substance dropped onto the road from such a vehicle, providing for severability, providing for inclusion in the Pasco County Code of Ordinance is providing for an effective date. Mr. Chairman, this came to you for introduction several months ago, uh, and then due to COVID, we had put off the final adoption hearing. This was at the request of Commissioner Wells um, to clean up intersections. It basically mirrors right. state law, um, but gives us some teeth with towing companies that fail to clean up the scene, the scene of an accident. Okay. Very good. Um, Commissioner Wells, I mean, this is a public hearing, but anything to add? There's, I know there's something you brought forward to us. Oh, I'm glad it's finally made it back to us, but no. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? No. This is a public hearing. Do we have anybody signed up via WebEx or any emails in relation to this item? Seeing none? No, I'm sorry, there are none. No? Anybody at the kiosk? There is nobody at the kiosk for this item. Okay, this will be a roll call. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. So set motion by uh, Commissioner Wells, a second by Commissioner Oakley. Madam Clerk calls the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 4 0. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Moving on, one sec here. For those at home, we have a new system we're using, so the numbers have changed a little bit. Um, okay, we're gonna go ahead and proceed with the procedures for rezonings. Mr. County Attorney, please review the procedures for rezonings. Be happy to, Mr. Chairman. There are two rezoning agendas, regular and consent. Staff will present each application to the Board of County Commissioners. If staff or planning commission has recommended approval and there is no opposition, the application will be considered by the board without further presentation. If staff or planning commission has recommended denial or if there is opposition to the application, the applicant will be given five minutes for presentation. The opposition will be given three minutes for each individual or five minutes for a group representative and the applicant will be given three minutes for rebuttal. Any individual disagreeing with staff or planning commission recommendation or anyone wishing to object to any condition of the rezoning may at this time request the petition be pulled from the consent agenda, in which case that application will be heard under the regular agenda later on during the meeting. Otherwise, all rezoning applications on the consent agenda will be approved by a single motion and vote. If you wish to speak to any petition, please give your name and address and whether or not you've been sworn for the record these are quasi-judicial public hearings. The law in Florida is that mere public support or opposition of an application is insufficient for this board to take action. Please limit your comments to those criteria found within the board's land development code. 
Thank you. Today we have eight public hearing items on the consent agenda. These items will be approved with one single vote without a presentation unless there is someone here in objection. Does a pre-register or at the public comment kiosk to speak to any of the items on the public hearing agenda? Prior to speaking, you will be sworn in by the clerk. Uh, so, Madam Clerk, is there anybody currently signed up to speak? There are no um, individuals signed up to speak via WebEx. Okay. Uh, anybody at the kiosk? The only people at the kiosk are the applicants for P79. Okay. So they know they they wouldn't be speaking unless somebody pulled this. So. Okay, cool. So I'm not going to do, I'm not going to have the clerk swear anybody in unless somebody pops up um, during the process um, via WebEx or the kiosk um, that wasn't currently signed up. So item P74 through 81 are the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, do we have proof of all those items, please? Yes. So I'll go through them. Item P74 was published in the Tampa Bay Times September 23rd, 2020. And I'll go through the rest. Is that? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Item P75 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on September 23rd, 2020. Item P76 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on September 16th, 2020. Item P77 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on August 26th, 2020. Items P78 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on September 9th, 2020, along with affidavits of certified mailings. Item P79 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on September 23rd, 2020. Item P80 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on September 23rd, 2020. And item P81 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on September 9th, 2020. Okay, we also do have, can you go ahead and read um, proof for 72 and 73 for me? Yes. Um, item P72 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on September 23rd, 2020. And item P73 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on September 23rd, 2020. Okay, thanks, Ms. Hernandez. I'll hang it over to you. These are both continuances, 72 and 73. Thank you. Denise Hernandez, Planning and Development. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Item P72 is PDD 21 CU04. It's uh, Tampa Bay Portfolio Holdings Delish Gourmet Cafe beer and wine uh, on premises consumption in conjunction with the operation of a cafe with outside seating and service. On this item, the applicant, instead of continuing it, the applicant, Mr. Caruso, has agree agreed to a withdrawal because by the time this makes through the public hearing process, we will have adopted the administrative use permit. Okay. So it's being withdrawn by the applicant, no action required. So I'm happy to see smiling faces at the <laughs> dais, Fine. even though it's a change in recommendation. Okay, great. So 72 is withdrawn, 73. Item 73 is PDD 21, CU01, District School Board of Pasco County, Vertex Development, LLC, Verizon Wireless for 140 foot above ground level, close bound monopole wireless communication facility in a master plan unit development district. The continuance date has actually changed as well. The applicants have just told me that they cannot make the 1117. So the request is to continue to 12820 BCC meeting at 130 in Newport Ritchie. Okay, was that advertised as a, as a continuance? It was not advert it was not originally advertised as a continuance, but it it was advertised for today as a continuance, but to a different continuance date. Okay, so I need to go ahead and take public comment then just probably since it was advertised as a different continuance date. What are, what are your thoughts? I can ask for it. How's that? You can ask yeah. for it. That I normally would say no because they could have gone to the next board meeting and then continued again. But yeah. if you might as well ask, and and we can. So we have anybody signed up for public comment on this item? No one is. <laughs> okay. Anybody at the kiosk for the, on this for this item? There is nobody at the kiosk okay. for that item. Any emails? No emails. Okay. Yeah. So I entertain a motion to continue this item to twelve eight twenty twenty. I have a motion by Commissioner Starkey. I think I heard of a second by Commissioner Oakley. Is that yes. correct? All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to the consent, uh, P74. DD21-7499, Buddy and Tricia Streeter for a change in zoning from R1, Rural Density Residential District, to R1MH, Single Family Mobile Home District. Comes to you with a recommendation of approval from the Planning and Development Department and the Planning Commission. Okay, so we have anybody signed up in opposition to this item on WebEx or by email? No one on WebEx and no email. Anybody at the kiosk? There is nobody at the kiosk for that item. Thank you. We'll leave on consent. P75. 
PDD 217500 for Pasco County Facilities Management Solid Waste Administration Building, change in zoning from an MPUD, Master Plan Unit Development District, and AR Agricultural Residential District to an I-1 Light Industrial Park District comes to you with a recommendation of approval from the Planning and Development Department and the Planning Commission. Thank you. Anybody sign up via WebEx or an email? No one signed up via WebEx or email. Anybody at the kiosk? There is nobody at the kiosk for that item. Thank you. Leave on consent. P76. PDD 217483, RLE Overpass, MPUD, Master Plan Unit Development, Villages of Pasadena Hills, Villages K, RLE Ranch, LLC, Inc., sorry, a rezoning request from AC Agricultural District to an MPUD, Master Plan Unit Development District, to allow 259 single-family detached dwellings on approximately 200 acres comes to you with a recommendation of approval with conditions as included in your agenda packet from the Planning and Development Department and from the uh, Pasadena Hills Planning and Policy Committee. Thank you. Anybody sign up via WebEx or email to speak on this item? No WebEx, no email. Thank you. No. Anybody at the kiosk? There is nobody at the kiosk for that item. All right, great. Thank you. Moving on, P77. PDD 217497 in the name of Martin F. and Donna L. Albach for a change in zoning from AR Agricultural Residential District to RMH Mobile Home District with a voluntarily agreed upon uh, deed restriction that limits the number of dwelling units to 120 single family detached <coughs> dwellings only, prohibiting mobile and manufactured homes. And that prior to the first develop preliminary development plan or within 180 days of the approval, there will be a development agreement. Um, agreement placed into with Pasco County to provide a drainage retention area adjacent to the future right-of-way comes to you with a recommendation of approval from the Planning and Development Department and the Planning Commission. Anybody here to speak in a, well, geez, sorry, anybody of WebEx? <laughs> okay, hold on a second, guys. I need, hold on, time out. <laughs> so, hold on one sec, Tracy, okay? Um, let me ask about WebEx and email first, and I'll come back to you on the kiosk. On Webex and no email submitted. Okay, kiosk. There is nobody at the kiosk for that item. Thank you. P78. Oh, I'll leave that one on consent. PDD 21 CU 32 for yep. conditional use and operating permit for a yard trash facility, Melvin and Martha Stutzman. Uh, for a yard trash facility in an AC agricultural district comes to you with a recommendation of approval with conditions as included in your agenda packet from the Planning and Development Department and the Planning Commission. All right. Anybody signed up via WebEx or email? No one signed up via WebEx and no emails. Kiosk? There is nobody here at the kiosk for that item. All right. Thank you. Leave on consent. P79. PDD 21CU03, Duke Energy, Florida, Inc., U.S. Air Force, for two 103-foot above-ground level wireless communication facilities and one 95-foot above-ground level in instrumentation platform to support U.S. Air Force communications in an AC agricultural district comes to you with a recommendation of approval with conditions from the Planning and Development Department and the Planning Commission. Thank you. Um, anybody sign up via WebEx or email? No one signed up via WebEx or email. Hey, Tracy, I know we have people out there, but do they want to speak or are they okay? They're, they're okay. They're just the applicants. Yep, okay, they're just okay. The okay. Oh, see no opposition. We'll leave on consent. P80. PDD 21, CU 06, RS Equity Holdings, bre breakfast station, sale of alcoholic beverages, beer and wine only, on-premises consumption in conjunction with the operation of a restaurant with outside seating and service of alcoholic beverages on a patio in a PUD plan unit development. And this comes to you with a recommendation of approval with conditions as included in your agenda packet by the Planning Commission and the Planning and Development Department. And this should be the last alcoholic beverage item that you hear. Okay. <laughs> All right, anybody here to speak in opposition to P80 via WebEx or email? Madam Clark? No one's on WebEx or email. Okay, um, in the, at the kiosk? Nobody here at the kiosk for that item. All right, P80, I guess you can go down to uh, across the street. And... P81. <laughs> PDD, uh, PW210012, it's Driftwood Village, first edition, paving assessment number 3395, and it's in the amount of $245,110, and the uh, recommendation is approval. Madam Clark, does anybody sign up via WebEx or email? No one signed up via WebEx and no email submitted. Do we have the kiosk to speak in opposition to this item? There is nobody at the kiosk for that item. Thank you. That does it for consent. I'll entertain a motion. So move. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Oakley, a second by Commissioner Moran. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. That does it for our regular agenda. We will move to old business.
We're going to start with Commissioner Oakley. Sir, do you have anything today? Okay. I uh, don't have anything to bring up today, so I'll save you some time. Thank you for your service. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Starkey. I do, but it involves Christy Sims, so I need to wait until she's uh, here in the room. I saw her a second ago. She um, was like, yeah, back out. I think we suggest that she'd be here at 2. I thought she was going to be here for that first first. She was order. here. Oh, she was when yeah. I was in the back? Yeah. Um, so I was on the phone with the constituent that has to do with the reason why she was going to be here. So um, I'll just wait. There she is. There she is. Okay, cool. And I'm, I'm glad that our ACA is here as well. And um, you're about to get a hard copy of an email that I, I received that kind of goes to this, this same issue. So um, I think I'm going to read you this email. And um, uh, this is from one of my constituents and one of your constituents that lives in Tat, uh, Tahitian Gardens or whatever. It says, um, on August 24th, I called the billing department and spoke to Marty regarding 3321 Cincinnati Drive, Holiday, Florida. This property has been vacant for over a year. There was a massive fire there. There was a car that caught on fire too in the garage. Everything is charred and burned terribly. Visible from just riding by, chunks of burned debris of, of the ceilings and walls are just hanging and dangling. There are rats running everywhere and there are little children playing nearby. Very scary. It's totally unsafe and a grave eyesore to our neighborhood. I explained this all to a Marty on 8420 and was given code CE code number 20-00-8751. Then I called again as per instructed on 922-20, gave the same above complaint and got CE code number 20-10, I mean 010423. Then on 923-20, Mr. Corr called me back and said that the above building has been in the demo demolition, but that the department ran out of money to hire contractors. So on 10 16 20, I called and spoke to Kathy, who gave me your email address. She looked up the code numbers that I was given, and both numbers are closed. What does that mean? I'd like to know that too. My concerns as a retired RN, one of, one of the directors on the board on TAT, and a concerned resident in my neighborhood, is that this, is, that this neglected property is extremely dangerous with rat infestation and dangling, burned, and charred particles that a child could get seriously injured. I hope this matter gets addressed with significant positive results. Thank you in advance. And then this person. So hmm. I've received many emails similar to this, and I brought up to you hmm. all the challenges, especially in my district, of the <coughs> lack of code enforcement. This is health. This is a health issue here. This, this is just not accessible to me. But I want um, Christy to fill you in on what's going on with our demolitions and give you some numbers. And I have them, Christy, if you don't have them, because I, I don't know how you can see it on that little thing. I got my big thing here. So, um, but floor is yours, Christy. <laughs> Please help. <laughs> so I, um, Keith Mead, our demolition manager, should be joining me. We I had told him to be here. Come on. <laughs> um, so, with is this the Zodiac property? No, this is a different one. A different one. <laughs> this is a different one. What was the name that they were reading? Um, this is in, in Tat. Um, I have the address. I, I switched it to you. So, but we, one of you guys just got a hard copy, so the address is on there if you want to. Let me stay on the down. surface of this because we've had, as you said, a similar issue on. Um, from a citizen last week on Zodiac. Yeah. So my response to the citizen um, was instead of her continuing to call because what she was calling about had been um, the determination to that it should be demolished or met the criteria for demolition had been made in May and nothing really had happened and she was asking about timetables. And my response to her is probably going to be the same with respect to any property that comes up. Um, and I think this was new information to Commissioner Starkey that the rest of the board may, be, may need to know as well. Um, the, um, as you know, um, starting last September, um, Building and Construction Services, who had been handling demolitions and community development before then, 
all of the demos were moved under the HRE task force umbrella. And um, I'll start with the good news first. Um, <laughs> this board uh, um, um, allocated um, significant general funds um, and since during fiscal year 2020, more than 130 structures were taken down. Um, taken down or taken down. Both slated for demolition? Taken down. Okay, very good. Are eradicated. Okay. Um, almost 40% of the, more than 130. Okay. Almost 40% of those were taken down by the owners, not at county expense. So having become a, somewhat of a victim of our own success, um, we're getting more and more um, requests to look at, at properties. We're identifying um, Mr. Mead and the one building investigator working under him. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Are getting more and more requests. However, we want you to understand um, one thing, which I probably wasn't fully aware of the ramifications of when the HRE team kind of took over this duty, um, which was there was 200 case backlog um, that had built up over the years. So Mr. Mead and his um, investigator, and he also supervises um, the one person who does all the clerical work as far as ordering um, property information reports, what used to be known as O&Es, um, sending out notices to demolish, et cetera. Um, they have had to take that backlog and try to prioritize the backlog as well as trying to keep up with what is coming in. And um, we've identified, um, Tiffany gave me buzzwords, Tiffany Payloff, the HRE coordinator, she gave me some buzzwords that, um, to use that we have been... You're not supposed to identify well, you know, buzzwords. You I, just use it, so use them. Y'all know me. And this, I, I don't use words like we're constantly assessing program metrics, but we are, I promise. I'm not good at buzzwords, so... We, we actually have a coordinator that is actively assessing program metrics and trying to identify pro areas for improvement in the process. Um, so... <laughs> to make a long story short, we, we've known we're running behind, we're behind the eight ball, we started off behind the eight ball, the eight ball keeps getting bigger, we're chasing it, we're chasing it. Um, I'll let Keith talk to you about some of that, but here are some of the revenue neutral um, <laughs> process improvements that we have identified to try to start chipping away more quickly at this back backlog. Um, the first thing is we have are out for rebid on the demo contractor um, vendor uh, contract, and the intention is to get more than one. So we would have maybe one contractor working on the east side and one working on the west. Um, that way we could be taking down houses in more than one location at a time. There's only so much capacity one vendor contractor can do. I mean, he can only take down one house at a time. So we intend to engage more than one demo contractor. We um, What's are, the timeline on that? I believe that we should have, it, I think it's going out for bid this month. So I, I would think by December we should purchasing person, somebody stop me if I misspeak, but I would think that by December we should have another one engaged, as well as our current one is to keep on working. Um, Commissioner Marion, I want to jump into. Yeah, if I could. Uh, the contract that we had over in Gulf Highlands on Scallop Drive, uh, that guy did a phenomenal job and did it fast. That's TNT, and yeah. they have been extremely extremely responsive um, and helped us um, organize the program from their perspective as well. Mm -hmm. And certainly we hope that they will continue to 
be a ven uh, one of at least one of the vendors. We've talked to them about in increasing their capacity. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain things that they could do, but they would need, you know, a commitment and a contract in order to expand their business to handle more business from us. To, to make the investment on it. So I would yes. say if we need to do that, let's go lay out the groundwork Letter. for that as well. Yeah. Because we, and we do and we do not want to slow those guys down no. at all. That's right. No. Keep them still. Extend that no. Right. Okay. So Thanks. we're talking about either increasing the capacity of our current one or okay. uh, and or engaging more than one. Um, and we have, we could pee back off the state's demo contract, but as you said, we're ver working very well with TNT. So, um, so that's one is increase the capacity of our of our ability to take them down. Number two is we've had some um, I'll say challenges um, with the O and E vendor. So we need to have more than one of those. We what's, we need to have multiple people um, order, ordering property and information reports before we can send out after Keith's team and Keith. Keith ultimately makes the determination that something meets the criteria, then we have to get a property information report to find out who are all the people that have an ownership or interest in this. So we can give them notice to take it down or appeal or we'll take it down. Those are their three options. Um, so that is also in the process of being reworked and rebid um, and I d I'm not sure um, what the timetable for that is, but in the meantime, um, we have plenty backed up that we already have orders on. Um, I would imagine, again, by the end of the year that we can get an O&E vendor. Jeff, do you think that's reasonable? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so the issue with the O&E vendor is that in 2017, the legislature decided to change the law and they allowed people other than lawyers and title companies to issue these property information reports. Mm -hmm. As part of that, they basically have said that the liability for issuing those property information reports is limited to the price you pay for them. So it becomes a liability issue um, if you're not sure that the vendor is providing you with everybody in the title chain, your only liability is the $175 that you paid for a title report, not the larger number of the house that you've taken down. And so that's, we're trying to work through that change in law since our contract just has expired. Okay. Um, so, in addition to uh, the um, another or more demo demos going on at the same time, more O and E reports going on at the same time, um, we've also identified a way to really double Keith's capacity. He can't go and look at every house. I mean, they just stickered three this morning that meet the criteria. Um, so he has a building inspector, Sam Lackey, who works under his direct supervision. Um, another member of the HRE team, Paul Salitz, we've determined meets the experience criteria to take the test to get his building inspector license. And I spoke with Paula and Esther about, um, you know, getting his application together. Once he becomes a building inspector, that essentially doubles Keith's capacity for they go out and do the initial determination, make take photographs, Keith reviews them, he signs off on them. So that will double our ability to do determinations. Um, and then Paul right now is the um, dedicated officer from code compliance to um, the HRE team and we would backfill as needed. Um, there's a couple of pure code um, high return task force uh, um, projects that we would like to do. The first of which is to send out demand letters to all these yards that we've paid to have mowed over the past however many years. 
and start demanding that they pay off those liens. Um, but I, I've spoken with the management down in code. They've always been very generous in temporarily loaning, you know, some of their personnel. We will assess whether our current clerical person, Jen Gardner, that is um, processing all of these needs more clerical help, and if so, we'll ask. It, you know, for somebody to be temporarily detached to help Jen process the paperwork for these demolitions. But I think that only through, um, you know, getting more capacity for our demo contractor, faster O and E's, and um, additional assistance for Keith to have somebody to lay eyes on the ones that keep rolling in. Um, and keep in mind, Keith and his team, not only, not only do they go out and look at them in the beginning, then they have to go out and they have to assess the property before our demo contractor can take it. They have to make sure that the electricity is turned off, identify where the sewer is, see if there's asbestos. And then after it's demolished, then they have to go back and make sure that everything was cleared and et cetera. Um, but we're certainly not suggesting we throw more money at the problem. We're looking at ways to force multiply what we have, um, get some more vendors on board to spend what's been allocated um, more quickly. Um, and if we need to, as far as the clerical aspects of it, we will, you know, ask to borrow some clerical personnel. You know, hey, can we have someone for two months to help us run through all of these notices? Um, but I think the key is going to be um, getting another <coughs> licensed building inspector, and we, we've identified that person. He's already on the team. Um, he just needs to take the test. And um, I, I will also say that another part of this that citizens have been asking about is what happens after right. we clear it. And um, I spoke with Mr. Biles about this earlier this year um, and said, hey, we have an irresponsible property owner, for example, that's let something sit there for 10 years. Um, and now they're going to let a vacant lot sit there for 10 years and it's going to become a dumping ground, et cetera, et cetera. He suggested that um, community development hire a, a, a program, what's the program coordinator to, because the, the answer to that is different in every question. We took down four, we cleared a four, four parcel area in the middle of a neighborhood and that neighborhood, for example, wants to turn it into a community garden or a passive recreational space. Um, sometimes the adjacent property owner may want the property. Um, we don't want to take ownership of all these properties. We can't afford to maintain and own all of these random properties everywhere. But the answer may be, for um, us to assist in getting it into the hands of a nonprofit like like Habitat for Humanity exactly. that will rebuild with a responsible owner and put it back on the tax rolls. So community development is working on the back end part of it. Um, I'm just letting y'all know that we know about the backlog. We are actively brainstorming how to address the backlog and we certainly appreciate the support for the program. It's absolutely paid off. Um, no time in the history of this county have we taken down 130 structures in a year, not even close. So Christy, do you have any idea um, how many lots we have um, in our possession? Or I guess that's two, two levels to that question. Some we own now, I guess, and some we should own because they're derelict lots. We don't own them. Okay. Um, I mean, we might own one of them. I think we own one, and it hasn't been a pretty process. Um, uh, all of the other ones are in the hands of, I would say, uh, of the ones that we've taken down, half of them, I would say, are investors that will, by their own nature, 
because it's an investment, replace the structure. The other half are sitting. Um, and something needs to be done with it. But that's that's my intuition. I haven't looked into that exact number or question. I can have Ms. Payloff pull those numbers for you as far as what's vacant and and that sort of thing. So if we were the ones to take down a structure, then we must have a lien on that property. <coughs> so we could for, enforce some kind of action on those, either get our money back, right? I mean, what, what are the steps where we could get some action going? You'd have to go through formal, formal foreclosure of your lien. Yeah, so what? why would we not want to do that and help move the neighborhood forward? We, we did that on one, sort of as a test case. Um, it took a full year, and that was before the court slowed down in COVID. And now we own it, and it's a problem. And we keep having to send public works out there to clean it up, et cetera, et cetera. We had to do an eviction for people that wouldn't leave. Um, it, it took a lot longer, and, and I, I'm treading sort of on Kathy's area here because she, They've been assigned a brainchild. Is that a legitimate, you know, thing? And we may wish to do that in some cases. In other cases where there's mortgage holders, our lien's just going to end up being foreclosed or lost. Um, but can't we force something to start happening? On our, on, I mean, even if we're not the only ones that are owed money on the lot. Well, and respectfully, I'd like to punt on that. I'd like to talk to. Um, our program coordinator and see what they've been thinking about and come back to you and tell you the answer to that. I really, I have the information and the answers for you. I don't want to give you bad information. I'm, I'm thinking this is a workshop What issue. we're doing on the backlog. Um, but I, I just simply don't know where they are in the process. She's new. Um, We've thought about it. I can assure you that we've taken steps to, you know, hire somebody to come up with the solution to this problem that we foresee. Um, because the more we take down, the more empty lots we're going to have. Right. Um, and so we've been proactive in addressing that. As far as where exactly we are in the process and. Whether there's multiple answers to what we do, which I'm sure there is, um, and how we go about that, I don't know. So I have one more question. I think Commissioner Mariano's looking like he has questions. But um, two, two comments. One, I remember when we had George here, and the banks were giving um, vacant properties to the county uh, or vacant houses. Uh, they would give them to us, and we would give them to George, who would kind of get them out to the nonprofits to rehabilitate and get people in with a special program. And um, so, may, you know, I don't know if that's still out there or not. Um, but as far as the houses that are slated to be demolished, is there, a, for example, this one is a burned structure that's dangerous to the community. Is there a ranking system as far as um, which demolitions need to occur first, even though you have 200? Yeah, we have 200, and to tell you the truth, usually on fires, and I don't know when the fire occurred, but normally on fires, we give them a little bit of time because there's usually insurance involved or settlements that need to be made before they can fix the house up. So we give them a little bit of time. We don't. I don't know when the fire occurred, and I just texted uh, the admin girl, Jen, to see if there is a CD case on this one. I was just reading this in my office when I came in here. Um, so I'm not 100% familiar with it. It doesn't ring a bell as far as us being out there. And I'm not sure where she got her information as far as code enforcement saying that it was in demolition, they ran out of money. I don't know where that came from. Well, she's, you know, she's quoting names here. Yeah, so yeah, she's talked I think to it's, someone. I think it's one of the code <laughs> enforcement officers, and we've spoken to them many, many times. It's like when it comes to demolition, direct them to us. We'll answer the questions on demolition. We don't need you giving them false information or telling them, you know, getting their hopes up, saying, oh, yeah, they're going to be out here next week to tear it down. They, they should not be doing that. Okay. So, and we, we've, we, we work very closely with them because the majority <laughs> of our referrals come from code enforcement. Um, we, some of them are, are, we see them ourselves driving to one. We see another one, so we stop and do an investigation. But uh, we, we do work closely with them. And I'll get to the bottom of this when we find yeah, out where we're at. Uh, you know, I have the Acela reports here, and there's 
seems like there should be a lot more information in here than there than there is. Um, I have both both numbers here. Uh, oh, actually, it's a copy. I only have one, 10423. I don't have the report on the other one. Well, the, the thing is, code enforcement uses a different Acela than, than we do. What? Yeah. So they have their own Acela program, and yeah, we have really our weeds, Acela program. Okay. So we can't see what they're doing, and they can't see what we're that, doing. That makes absolutely no sense to I me. I agree 100%. <laughs> well, okay, that's, that's an offline conversation. I okay, think. yeah. Yes. Um, so I have one more question for you guys, and that is the drug house behind Wawa, the, the trailer that I went and visited that had all the garbage. Um, On Holiday Drive? Yeah. Yeah, we've been out there. I've actually been inside that structure, and yeah, you know, that was last year. And I know code enforcement with PSO was in there uh, about a month ago. Um, the, the structure itself, by definition of the ordinance, does not meet the criteria for demolition. I mean, I know there's lots of crime and lots of drugs. When I was out there last time with PSO, they arrested four people on site. Yeah, so it's, it's a travel trailer from 1960. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's 60 years old. It's not, an, it's not a mobile home. It's a, it's a travel oh, trailer. Oh, I, I understand. We see, we see them there all over the place. And it's still habitable and good shape. Yeah, actually, believe it or not, yes, it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, and unfortunately, I can't just say, okay, it's, it's a crappy RV from 1962. We should take it out. Because if they do appeal it, then I have to explain that to... So how many people can live in a, you know, 100 square foot travel trailer from 1960? Well, by code, you're, I think it's 50 square feet per occupant of a residential structure. So, but, but it's grandfathered from, if it was put there in 1962, it follows the land development code and building code from 1962. This is where you'll find a lot of the folks who like to hang out at our bus stop there. That's still there. This is where they, this is their other hangout place. This is where they live back there. Okay, I think there's another question. Is it Mayo? Commissioner Mariana? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as far as let's talk about the financial capacity to go tear down more homes, because you, you say that there's a bunch more that you can take down if you had the funds. Oh, there's a lot. Like she said, we already have, we have a backlog of over 200 cases. This, just this calendar year, not fiscal year, since January 1st, I think we're on case number 190 right now that have met the determination for demolition. So do you need the funding to be able to take them down, but judging by the letter we saw on Cincinnati Drive? I mean, well, that, that letter, I, I don't know. Not that but, but, so but, the new, but the new fiscal year just started, and right. yes, there was funding allocated. I just, a half million dollars. A half million dollars was okay. allocated for the program for fiscal year 21. And at this point, until we can increase our administrative and Dem actual demo capacity, mm -hmm. that's all we can, that's all we physically can do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we have maxed out as far as how many he can investigate, how many ONEs, you know, we can order, absorb, do the clerical work on, and how many our demo contractor can take down. Now, certainly, as an attorney, um, I don't do math. But um, <laughs> I've been warned by people who do that Sorry. if I start getting close, if we start getting close to what the board has allocated in March <laughs> or so, we will come back to you and say, hey, we've taken down this many, we've spent this much money, do you want us to go do other things between now and the end of the fiscal year, or do you want to allocate more money to the program? So. At this point, I don't think that y'all saying, hey, here's another $200,000 isn't going to move us forward because of these logistical process improvements that we are making. Okay, well, I think logistically, you've got a pretty good budget to start with. If you go through it and you need more, I think this board's gonna say, come back and ask for more money. Mm -hmm. uh, next thing, now, it's hard when you take down a house because now you've got an issue with what's left. And Correct. what's going to happen to it? Yes. yes. Um, talking about the one even on Scallop Drive, you get two houses right beside it. They're afraid of just people just going in there. As a matter of fact, some of the old residents there are kind of dropping off trash. I had to pick them up the other day. Uh, you got to mow the grass, et cetera. So we want to go turn those things back. Right. So if we're struggling getting those turned, then there's like, I know there's plenty in Jasmine, I'm sure there's plenty in the Holiday, et cetera. Empty lots sitting there that aren't doing the taxpayers any good. 
aren't doing the neighborhood any good. So I would love for us to go explore if it's not working with the banks, working with the nonprofits, working to say that we need may, may even maybe may even need to put a special program together, something maybe we work something with a tax break or something to yeah. get a new home put in there or something. Yeah, we've we've done that. Um, we anticipated the problem. Um, Ms. Pearson's uh, group with community development has hired a project coordinator um, who is studying the various options that we have for these properties. That's right. what I said that I can't tell you exactly where they are in that process, but that we already know that that has to be done. So can I jump in real quick? I mean, let me, let me just real quick, because this is really, really important, obviously, to a lot of people. So right now we're getting like 30 minutes of this one subject matter. That's why we need a workshop. So I think we need to either schedule an agenda item or a workshop, or bring it into a workshop or an agenda item. I agree. If you guys good with that? Yep. Because I, I think we can literally discuss this for two more hours, <laughs> which is fine. We need to do it, but this gives your and your love demolition. Yeah. So we'll talk but, all day on another day, yes. whenever you tell yeah. us to. I think, that, I think it also gives you guys time to prepare and you know have some some answers uh, prepared for some of the questions that are being asked and continue to be asked. I will though. I do want to give credit where credit's due. Um, so if I'm not correct, the year before last, we only probably demoed 20 or 30 homes, and last year it was upwards 130 or more. We're a victim of our success. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, but at the same time, congratulations and thank you to the teams for all your great efforts because you literally demoed five to seven times more last year or, than we did in previous years. Actually, probably more than that. Maybe like more like eight or ten times more. So, are you guys, everybody okay with us? But I have one more question for Christy. Not, not on that same subject, but it is Christy's world that I wanted to ask okay. her. So, uh, and I'm getting these calls again. And so, uh, and there was a newspaper article about juries. So are we able to send code enforcement out now and tell them they can't have garbage piled up on their house and give them a citation? So I know on the west side, they have set their first final hearing date for December. Um, so I would say yes, that they could start writing citations. Um, Hallelujah. Good. Yes. Okay. As to when the court will set them for hearing on the east side, I don't have that information right at my fingertips because I don't usually that Patrick Moore handles the month to month citation stuff. But um, la just last week, we we got information that they had set on the west side a final hearing date in December. Okay. Well, I, I think this is a really important issue, and I'm, I'm glad that we're going to, I think, move this to a workshop yeah. to, to BD. Well, that is an agenda item on one of your board meetings. Workshops logistically don't, we don't have space, social distance to do a workshop okay. in the format you do a workshop. But, I, you know, I want to hear from the nonprofits and others on how, and Kathy's department, how this could all work together, because it doesn't do any good to take down a house in a neighborhood then becomes the place where everyone puts their their washing machine and their sofa and all that stuff. And then as we've seen on some, they pitch their tents and they live on it. Then we have to get the sheriff in. So I think we have to have a comprehensive plan. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Great, great. Makes 100% sense. So maybe if you want to work with Dan and his team to formulate that agenda item, we'll bring it back and, uh, yeah. soon. Be happy to. Thank you both for everything you do. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Starkey, uh, I just spoke to my uh, admin, uh, Jen, and there is a CD case on this one. So it's just a matter of ordering a property report and then take it from there. So we're, we're already aware of it. We've been out there. And I, I would like, you know, to have some coordination between the two offices because when our constituents call and they're told it's closed, well, there are, you know, yeah, they get, we, we ah, need to, it's the wrong department. We what need to straighten that out. There actually is a lot of coordination. It's just that all all um, questions regarding the status of anything on demo needs, we, we have a dedicated email, demo contact. I just mean that um, the information should should be between, well, she spoke to it the should be more transparent. She spoke to the code enforcement case numbers. Those were closed out because it came to us and now it's a CD. Yeah, number. but there should be a message there. But somebody in the building gave her There's the wrong number, right? so it was mis- It's know, a process. There's a step missing. I, I the, will handle it. The processes. Processes. 
I will okay. handle it. Thanks, Thank guys. You all. Great and job. I didn't get to say this earlier, but Commissioner Wells, <laughs> I thank you for your support, plain speaking, and um, your respect that you've given, not just to me, but to my colleagues as well over the years. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Feel the same about you. <laughs> Bye, Christy. See you, Christy. Yeah, you up with Jeff. Okay, um, one more one more thing. I <laughs> wanted to uh, thank staff for um, helping out with the tat cleanup. Oh, were you talking? No, go ahead. You're Sorry. good. You just cutting jokes. Get I can't jokes. hear in these things. It's my I last meeting. I'm just barely I'm here, Commissioner Mariano. <laughs> um, but I know we want to move along. So, uh, 46 tons came out of the tat cleanup, and uh, in the next few weeks we'll have the holiday lakes clean up so thank you very much for that thank you got anything commissioner wells real quick um yes and thank you all again excited it's my last meeting and sad but thank you um and i noticed that chairman moore's already commented on this in the paper but if you didn't see it and it's commissioner mariano's district but i grew up in port ritchie you know with the olsner mound make being the 11th pasco location to make the national registry designation is a big deal. Um, spent a lot of time around Olsner's Mount as a kid, and uh, so I thought it was pretty cool. It's, uh, you know, with, with the last one being a historic courthouse back in 2006, so I just, I thought it was pretty neat that, you know, it's a big deal, so. Very cool. And that's yeah. all, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we kind of did a tourism-related <laughs> piece to that. Yeah. Commissioner Mariano. Thank you, and uh, <clears throat> uh, th thanks to Mike Carmel and the team for scheduling Country Club Estates, which is going to do their cleanup this Sunday. Um, looking forward to that. I just drove through the neighborhood again, and I'll tell you, we, when we did the road paving assessment, the neighborhood looks phenomenal. I don't know if we're going to get 46 tons, but I'm glad we're going to go through it because it's, it's really come a long way, and they appreciate the stormwater improvements. Um, I'd like to say I, I appreciate the board this morning, and, and Mike with his team again, uh, you know, with the BP Restart money, we've been looking, trying to get money for many, many years, sitting on the committee, trying to, like, work to get what we can for Pasco, and we did very well with Pot 3. But uh, we had an al extra allocation, uh, not doing a project in Cruise Lake, a $1.4 million sitting for the county commission. Uh, and we took advantage of that today on consent agenda. So that $1.4 million can go code the dredge, which is going to help quite a bit for, for cutting the cost down. So we're lucky to get it. Staff did a great job setting it all up and coordinating, and I appreciate the board going through with that. Now, for a really good thing, uh, we got a video. On uh, October 8th, we had a World War II veteran, Navy veteran, Jim Rickus, uh, that was, someone was going to plan an event. And it was funny because I saw it on Facebook, just like a little pink blurb on a screen saying, 100-year-old uh, veteran going to join at the Hudson Library at 1 o'clock, you know, come on out. So I put in the calendar and I go. And uh, the day before that, I think it was, Kathy Pearson calls me up. She goes, you know, in your district, there's something really big going on. I think you want to want to be there. It's kind of like really de developing. I go, really? What is it? So she tells me about it. So I go to my calendar, and bam, there it is. So what Kathy did with the team, you're going to see here, is absolutely phenomenal. The enthusiasm in the whole neighborhood. We had people that were watching it on Facebook Live, jumping out, jumping in the cars, and getting behind the line just to kind of get in and, and to support this guy. And uh, you'll, you'll see the quotes at the end. When, when this World War II veteran came back. Thank you, sir, for your service. <laughs> Honor to be in your presence. Thank you. Oh. Here, you want to put it in the bag? Thank you, sir, for your service. 
Oh, that's and, really and then cool. at the end, we actually all sang him happy birthday too. It was it was really cool. He was uh, just just thrilled, um, you know, for a veteran coming back. And you know, those days you just came back, you just went back to doing what you were doing. Uh, so he really really appreciated the, uh, the 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 support that was out there, and it was pretty cool. Now, kind of neat. Staff did such a great job. The total reach uh, on Facebook was two hundred and seven thousand and three. Uh, engagements 15,730, likes almost 12,000, shares 830, comments 338. And I'll tell you, even my mailman, who, the, the, but this guy's actually a retired mailman as well, oh, okay. uh, he come up to me and goes, wow, he says, that was, that was awesome what you guys did for that man. That's cool. So uh, staff, Kathy, the whole team, I mean, just, it, was, it was just an awesome day. Pasco County supporting their veterans, showing how much we care. Uh, this gentleman got to see it in a, in a great way, so That's awesome. just, just a feel-good story. Good job, guys. Thanks. It's amazing. Great. Thank you, sir. Mr. Biles, do you have anything? Yes, sir, just a couple things. One, uh, we'll let you know that um, our assistant director at Animal Services, Spencer Cronover, was uh, selected to be a member of the Board of Directors <coughs> of the National Animal Care and Control Association. So, you know, he's going to have an impact kind of guiding how we treat animals and animal services, animal controls throughout the nation uh, as a member of that board. So I want to let you know that. The other thing is um, on your on the board agenda, not 98, noted item 98 was our end of the September quarter report to U.S. Treasury on the CARES program. And so just it's 50 something pages in the formatting they wanted us to submit it. But if you want, if you're bored at some point, want to see where all the money is going. but. To date, uh, we've expended or committed over $62 million of the $96 million allocation, right. so we're on track uh, to spend that and get that out into the community to zero by the end of the calendar year. So just want to give you, so we're 64% committed or expensed uh, through the end of September, so we're on track. So That's really good because uh, some of our neighboring counties are far below that, and they're going to, I don't know, I don't know how I got to yeah. make that deadline. Yeah, I'll, I'll, they, can, the send money their, the they can send their money to us. We'll take care of it for them. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> I like that. Anything else? Nope, sir. That's it. Can Ralph speak under you about an <laughs> event coming? <laughs> Unless you want to speak. Can I keep going? Yeah, just Ralph needs the podium for a second whenever you want. I'll yield my time to Mr. Lair. Hey, you don't have anything? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have anything? He you don't know, your time. <laughs> A surprise visit for me. I, I apologize. <laughs> I think Commissioner Stark, you wanted me to come up to uh, bring up the um, ribbon cutting we're having for the Starkey Gap Trail on November 13th. Uh, it's turning out to be a big event where we will have the ribbon cutting at the trail. We have former President of the Senate, Andy Gardner, who had the vision for the Coast to Coast Trail which is a 250 mile trail from St. Petersburg, Pinellas County, going over to the Space Coast. So we have a continuous trail now. Uh, with the completion, there are still about 50 miles worth of gaps around the state, but that's a big event uh, that we are looking forward to, to having. Um, and a lot of dignitaries will be in town from uh, Tallahassee for that. So we're looking forward to that. So we hope you can come out to that on one thirty. Uh, one thirty. Yes. Bring your bike. <laughs> so you want to see everybody out there and bike and ride, and then we're we're doing a, a, another smaller one that that's on, uh, that for the coastal and Clode coming up at the end of the month, and that's just a virtual event. So we'll film that, uh, and so you'll get to see that ribbon cutting. Thanks, Ralph. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Miss Alvarez. Oh. <laughs> to get both of those in there i'm sorry it's hard isn't it yeah all right so uh two quick updates um uh, commissioner starkey had mentioned about jury trials they are resuming coming up um our first trials will be back on on monday november 2nd um, it will be limited seating for social distancing and the court is focusing on the cases where um, criminal cases where defendants are in custody to have manage those first and then they'll move on through there um, the other thing I wanted to mention, I sent an email yesterday about um, our Operation Greenlight. It's going to be occurring over three days in November. The um, date is November 18th, 19th, and 20th. 
We're going to open up our phone lines early and to stay late during those days. So uh, from the phone, you can call between 7.30 and 6.30. And then during the workday, it is from 8.30 till 5 p.m. And um, we're here to help those customers that have suspended driver's licenses because of past due criminal um, court ordered financial obligations or traffic tickets. And during those three days, they can save up to 25% in additional uh, fees. And once they pay the, the fees or the enter into a payment plan, they are then eligible to um, go to the tax collector's office to have their driver's license reinstated. So um, just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that event and to spread the word. It'll be out on our social media and we'll have flyers and so on. So that's it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right, just got a couple things. Um, I wanted to make sure there was a clear record since this was a change of something we announced at the last meeting. There's been a change in appointments. Commissioner Stark will be our representative on the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee, and Commissioner Mariano will be um, the MPO Advisory Committee. There's does not need a, need a motion. Um, it does not need a motion because <clears throat> just that chair's under the um, that um, authority's under the chair. So, just for the record. That's done. I do want to bring up a little bit about uh, um, the FDOT diverging diamond interchange. I know because I was on a letter with Commissioner Starkey, it was sent to both of us, starting to get quite a few emails and calls in reference to the d delays on the diverging diamond. It's very frustrating to me. I'm sure it's very, very frustrating to all of you too as yeah. well. I know when I first came on, Commissioner Wells first came on, you know, that was slated to be start of what, 2024. Mm -hmm. We worked very hard with our legislators. And I know it was one of my main priorities to get that thing moved up, which we did, thankfully, and Rouse help as well, working with Speaker Corcoran and, and back then, you know, and then Senator Simpson and Representative Burgess and got that funding moved up. Well, <laughs> now, we're, now we're into going into 2021. This was supposed to be done in the summer of 21 and be finished and completed. Unfortunately, they're delayed. Um, and just, I want to make sure, you know, and I did have a nice conversation with um, Secretary Gwynn, but I did mention to him, I'd be probably be bringing this up today because I think it's important for the citizens and the constituents to know that obviously this board and this county are very, very supportive, but we have absolutely zero control. When I say zero, zero control over these contractors or that project because that is a DOT project. Um, so I did speak with him, and I just wanted, for the record and for other commissioners, I want to tell you what I heard from him. And the const construction, construction company is DAB Constructors, <coughs> which I'll talk about in a second afterwards, because I think they're on some projects here in Pasco County. Um, this is a long conversation. I'm going to run over a, just a few things. The original project was to be completed in, I think, approximately 800 days. Um, you know, excluding final touches, clean up, things like that. But you typically, when the project's done, you can start driving on the um, interchange, and they just have some, you know, little things to pick up on and, 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 uh, and clean up before that. So far, the contract has been uh, granted, I think it's 173 days of extension, 173 days, 99 rain days. I don't know how that is, but okay. 99 rain days. I guess if it sprinkles out, they don't work. Um, 34 holidays. I didn't know we had that many holidays, but they've been granted 34 holidays, which seems extreme to me. Um, plus 30 for utility companies, they, set, they stated failing to complete work on time or in 30 plus days for change orders. Um, According to the allowances, um, the project should be completed by October 2021, 20, but the contractor um, themselves has projected 2022, the spring of 2022. So some of the things that um, Secretary Gwynn told me that they're doing, which I think is good, um, they, they're stopping awarding any additional contracts actually to that contractor. That's something I actually don't think I've ever heard happen before, but they are actually not awarding them any additional contracts at this time. Um, they've actually approved some variances that will provide, I guess, for some stone wall foundations to help with um, the, side, the walls on the side. They did issue a letter of concern requesting the contractor to apply additional resources to the project, and they want proof from the contractor that they're getting the project back on schedule. 
which would be a date of October 2021. Um, They've also leveraged their liquidated damages. There's penalties of $10,000 a day or $300K a month for late delivery. So FDOT has stepped in and doing some things. I was also told that I think they brought them all the way up to Tallahassee to have these discussions. Very, very frustrating. What's unfortunate and really frustrates me is that, and I'm glad they stopped giving this contractor contracts because they have so many projects going on right now, they cannot handle it. They're subbing out a lot of their things, but they can't even handle their own projects. And there lies the problem. So, are they on any projects right now with Pasco County? And are we able to prohibit them from bidding on any of our projects because they're behind other projects? I, they're, I know they're on the 52 project, which is behind. They're on 54, which is behind. And our county, those are FDOT projects. But are they on any Pasco County projects right now? Or are they have they recently bid on any projects in Pasco County? And the next question would be for the county attorney's office. Can we prohibit them from bidding on this project since they're so far behind in others and we know they won't be able to deliver because they can't deliver on their current contracts? So I'm waiting to hear back. I'm waiting to hear back from staff to see if you've got them on current jobs right now. Yeah. Um, I know we have done work with that company in the past mm -hmm. uh, as to how their performance was, but we'll have to get back with, with purchasing and go back through what the, what the record shows. I don't okay. know. Yeah, so from my understanding, from having this conversation, they, again, they are behind on number, numerous projects all the way up into uh, 19, if any of you have driven 19 up in Hernando County, that seems like a never-ending project either. And it's, you think about how quickly some of our recent projects have gone, say at State Road 56, that was smooth, right? I mean, I don't, that might have, I may have been ahead of schedule, but well, I, I pretty much I think it was. Um, worked out great. But it, again, it's, it's frustrating to our constituents here. It's frustrating to the business owners. And I know Commissioner Starkey and I have received a letter mm -hmm. from um, a group of businesses over on the um, east, the west side of the interchange, um, everywhere from the outlet mall to across the street to Sierras and all those properties too. I drive it daily. My wife drives it daily. My oldest daughter probably drives it three to four times a week in what she does. So. Anybody that tells you they're behind <laughs> and they're running behind and it's taking a long time to get through the interchange, they're telling the truth because mm -hmm. I drive it constantly. It's not pleasant. I, so we can tell I'm frustrated. Yesterday when I drove through there, I took a few photos. I'm not going to put them up. I saw one truck. I don't know what he was doing. I'm not a contractor. And I saw two guys standing on the sign and I saw a group down below. On a project of that magnitude, those are the only people I saw working on a Monday, a sunny Monday, and a little cool at that actually, um, working on that project. And that was about 115, 130 when I drove by there. Those are the only people working on that project. That's insane. That's ridiculous. That's embarrassing. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So when I received that letter, I reached out to Secretary Gwynn right away, um, and um, and he, you know, informed me what the actions they were taking against DAB. Um, gave me a little history on DAB that this was a company that was owned by the parents and they kind of retired and gave it to their, what, 30-year-old son or, you know, a, a young man who uh, probably has um, gotten in over his head. I will let you know DAB was the, develop the builder or the contract winner of the Starkey Gap, which was delayed by at least a year maybe. Same company. Um, we had all kinds of problems with DAB on the, on the Starkey Gap. Um, we did, um, just to let you know, Commissioner Moore, uh, send out a letter to Mr. Sierra, who I, I know personally, and Mr. Whitley, um, letting them know um, what Secretary Gwen, what the steps were that he was doing. Um, we also, um, in talking um, with Secretary Gwen, let them know that, you know, the, a big problem with this is this is going to put them, that divergent diamond will not be open for next year's holiday season. It's going to be in question for that season. That's um, but we think the overpass, um, is, that, is it right? It's the overpass one? No. What? There's maybe. It would be on construction on the, over, yeah, on the overpass. Yeah. Um, the, but they said that there will be another one that will be open that will help relieve this one. I have to look There's at the There's no other interchanges that um, 52 oh, interchanges. this is what, um, what was, uh, oh, no, I think Dan Biles told me 
the overpass interchange will be opening in the last quarter of 2022. We haven't what you told me? On that. I know, but that's what I was told that it would be opening in the last quarter of 2022, that. and it may alleviate some of the traffic issues. So is that incorrect? Because that's what we well, sent them. Because that's what we were told in my office. It's going to alleviate traffic. That's why one of the reasons it's being done, but it's not going to help out with the current situation. Well, it's another well, exit yeah, we, point. We, yeah, we know. Yeah, it's, yeah. All those are. Dead. I mean, so it's just a shame oh. that this is put behind that it'll be you know the holiday season that's so good for that that corner so very unfortunate that um this is happening but i think dot is doing as much as they can to push it along well i so i'm glad to see the things they are doing now um i would you know i've talked to some of our legislators too and i'm gonna continue to talk to some of our other legislators and leadership as well to make sure the pressure stays on because the pressure needs to stay on if um, you know if they can default them, the only problem with defaulting somebody is that unfortunately they have to go through the process again. It puts a delay it for could, a year. It could, it, it what they could told do me. That. So, so what? So let me continue. Yeah. Um, so basically, what needs to happen is they need to hold their feet to the fire. And if you tell somebody they're not going to be done in October of 21, when they're supposed to, and you fi start finding them $300,000 a month or withhold their payments, people usually open up their ears. My, my mind is they should just, <clears throat> they should sub out every little piece of that project going forward as DAB, cut their losses, get out. That's my opinion. I think there's a bigger problem here, yeah. and that is, and I think we saw that up in Tallahassee when they, um, uh, they bid on that new uh, contractor for, um, for some uh, IT stuff, is that they, they shouldn't have to take the lowest bidder. They, there should be more in that matrix that allows for performance. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's something we could talk to our legislators about in these purchasing contracts. Performance should count a lot more than it does currently. So There's limited number, and I don't want to get this wrong, um, but either Mr. Steinsteiner, maybe Ralph, somebody might know. <clears throat> They're unfortunately they're limited to the amount of contractors too, even though some of the contractors are really good contractors because of some of the requirements that can't be met. And I think that I don't want to call it a, the bond. There's actually what you, similar to a bond, if I'm not correct, they must have. There's certain criteria that has to be met right now. So a lot of some of your contractors are literally really good and all they're doing is getting the sub work. So you have some of them. So XYZ company will get will win the bid. They only have to construct, I think it's maybe up to 30% of the project, possibly, and the subs can do up to like 70%. So they'll go out there and win all these bids, these, and then they'll subcontract all their work. It's a racket. <laughs> Let's just be honest, it's a racket. Yeah. So it's unfortunate. They should allow more people to be involved and we wouldn't run into these issues. And I know I'm talking a lot on this, but it's very frustrating. Very, very frustrating. I know it's very frustrating for the citizens and the business owners alike. So hopefully what they're doing, and I appreciate Secretary Gwynn, I appreciate the pressure they are now at this time putting on them. But again, I'll state it never should have gotten this far behind. I think this should have been taken care of a year ago when we saw it was how slow they were running. So last question then. If they do not, if this contract does not have any current jobs with us, can we prohibit them from moving forward or bidding on any future jobs with Paso County, considering how it's public record, how far they be are behind on their projects with the state. If they are not debarred by DOT, it's my off the cuff opinion um, that we probably could not um, prohibit them from bidding on a project. Now, that being said, they also have to be responsible and responsive. And so that may be the criteria that they would fall off, off of. They could be low, but if they're not responsive and responsible, we wouldn't have to award to them. Mm -hmm. But we'd have to evaluate that when and if they bid and that sort of thing. And to Commissioner Moore's point, can Just we put in severe that. financial uh, penalties? Are we allowed to write? what our yeah, own we penalties can. are yeah, we, we, we do in every contract you issue whatever we want to you know that will well you it's signable within, <laughs> within legal reason yes yeah i mean you you currently with contracts like that you have provisions for liquidated damages if they don't finish i will you know point you back to the ridge road yeah 
exactly. widening project <laughs> and whether or not that really works. <laughs> but um, that's, you know, that we do have, we do as a standard matter have those provisions in your contract. I was going to go right along that line, so I'm good. But, uh, you know, Commissioner Stark, Commissioner Moore, thanks for staying on top of it, going through it. I did talk to Secretary of DOT, uh, Secretary Gwynn. He's, he is phenomenal to work with, yeah. so I know he's working for us, too, but keep, keep the pressure on. We need to. Any last words, Commissioner Wells? <laughs> you drop it? <laughs> oh, here, I'll give you it here. You, 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 you take the final. No, take give it to him. Yeah, you're the final. German. Okay. That word German. There you go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That was good.